All right. I'm one year older today, so I have to wear my glasses again. <laughs> Thanks. It's not about me. Sorry. I was just trying to crack a joke. Anyway, let's read. Um, Habakkuk, the oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw. O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for your help, and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity, and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. Look among the nations and see, wonder, and be astounded. For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, who march through the breadth of the earth, to seize dwellings not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle swift to devour. They all come for violence, all their faces forward. They gather captives like sand. At kings they scoff. And at rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress, for they pile up earth and take it. Then they sweep by the wind and go on, guilty men whose own might is their, is their God. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment, and you, O Rock, have established them for reproof. You who are pure eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong. Why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? You make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. He brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his dragnet, so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore he sacrifices to his net and makes offerings to his dragnet. For by them he lives in luxury, and his food is rich. Is he then to keep on emptying his net, and mercilessly killing nations forever? I will take my stand at my watch post, and station myself on the tower, and look out to see what he will say to me, and what I will answer concerning my complaint. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God. Well, it is a joy, again, to be with you all this morning. Uh, if you have your Bibles, please do keep them open. And again, that was page 933 in the Pew Bibles. Because what I have to say only matters if it flows forth and reflects what God has to say to us. So let's invite him to speak once more. Please pray with me. Oh Lord, you have spoken and you have given us your word. We pray now, Lord, that you would speak by your spirit to our hearts. That you would enable me to faithfully proclaim the message that you have for your people. And you would enable each one of us to receive and believe and be renewed and transformed and led and guided by your good word. We pray this in the name of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. You might not have noticed, I'm sure you have, that the world around us is not the way it's supposed to be. You may have picked that up by now. There is violence. There's injustice. There's wickedness. It's out there. You turn on the news and you see it. Uh, but not just way out there. It's right, right here. In our communities. In the streets and behind closed doors in homes. 
there is violence and injustice and wickedness in our neighborhoods and even in our own hearts. We are not the way we're supposed to be. And we live in a world, a community, a nation that's not the way it's supposed to be. We all know that, right? And so it's easy to get used to that. It's easy to get complacent about that. It's easy to say that's just the way it is. And I can't do anything about it or I can't do much about it. And so I'm not going to focus on that. I'm going to focus on just trying to get by. Or maybe, hey, if the world's not fair, I might as well join in. You know, if the only way to get ahead is to look out for number one and step on whoever you have to in the process, well, that's the way the world is. Why not me be the one on the top of the heap? That's obviously wrong. But the complacency that says, not my problem. I'm not going to worry about that. I'm just going to focus on my own concerns. Is something that we're very easily tempted to. And God's word calls us out of that. God's word does not allow us to be comfortable in this world the way it is. It calls us to be dissatisfied with the wrong that we see all around us. But the question is, what do we do with that? What do we do with that dissatisfaction? Where do we go? Who do we turn to? That's what we're going to be looking at here in the book of Habakkuk. Uh, today we're in Habakkuk chapter 1 through the first verse of chapter 2. Next week I'll be back again. Uh, at least I, 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 that's the plan. Hope you, hope you let me come back again. Uh, back again and we'll do ch- the rest of chapter 2. And then a couple weeks after that, uh, my colleague Wes Hebert, who's also a pastoral resident at Valley Bible Church, uh, will be here to do chapter 3, which rounds out the whole book. So we're doing the whole book of Habakkuk. It's a short book. Uh, it's a, a beautiful book. Uh, Wes gets the the fun chapter. Chapter 3 is a song. It's a psalm. Uh, It's presented that way. It has musical notations. Um, And that's how Habakkuk ends his book, which is unusual for a prophet. This is a prophetic book. And prophets, I know you've spent a lot of time in Ezekiel in the last year, so you've, you've encountered prophetic writing. The prophets speak a word from God to his people. But Habakkuk is spending most of his time talking with God. It begins not with, thus says the Lord, but with, Lord, what's going on? How long? And so Habakkuk, the whole book feels a lot like the Psalms. As this believer pours out his honest questions, his honest struggles to God, and looks to God for help and deliverance. See, Habakkuk, we find In verses 2 to 4, Habakkuk is facing a problem. And we need to see that problem, but we also need to see Habakkuk's posture in the way he approaches the problem. Habakkuk turns to the Lord and he says, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity? And why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed. And justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. So justice goes forth perverted. Habakkuk looks at his world and he sees that it is messed up. Habakkuk is a prophet living in the kingdom of Judah. And we'll find out in a little bit that he's living towards the end 
of the kingdom of Judah. God's people have been living in the land he gave them for centuries, and for centuries they have repeatedly turned away from his good word, turned away from his commands to worship other gods and to take advantage of each other. And if you read the story of God's chosen people living under his good word, You have a story of violence and oppression and injustice. And Habakkuk is one of those prophets whose job is to lead these people back into the way of the Lord. To to speak God's word to them and say, this is the good way, walk in that. And they say, no, we will not walk in it. Things are not going so well for Habakkuk and his ministry. And so he cries out to the Lord. And that's the important thing we need to see. Habakkuk sees a problem. But his posture is one of faith. He takes his problem and he brings it to God. And he says, Lord, look at what's going on here. He brings his complaint to God. And he keeps on bringing it, even though he's been bringing it to God. He says, Lord, I've been crying out. And you, do you hear? Because nothing's changing. I've been, violence, I have been dialing 911. And no one's picking up. And no responders are arriving. Where are the flashing lights? Where is the emergency team? Lord, I want to report that I've made reports and I'm still not seeing a response. Well, here he brings this complaint back to God again. He keeps on turning to God. And here now, God finally answers But the answer is not what Habakkuk was expecting. You know, we often have unanswered questions. But sometimes we have answered questions and the answers are maybe even worse, harder. Not knowing what's going on can sometimes be a lighter thing than actually knowing what's going on. And God speaks to his prophet beginning in verse 5. And he brings this unbelievable answer. He says, look among the nations and see. Wonder and be astonished, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. But I'm going to tell you anyway. There is something shocking going on. He says, behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans. Now, anybody met any Chaldeans lately? (laughs) Visited Chaldeans, you know Chaldeans? Okay, so this is important. We need to understand what's going on in Habakkuk's day, in his time. This over here, this is the Mediterranean Sea coast. And down at the southern end of it, is this little kingdom of Judah that has been dwindling over the last few generations, smaller and smaller. It's on the borders of this ancient civilization along the Nile River called Egypt that used to be the big power. But for the last hundred years, the big power has been a group of people who live up here in northern Mesopotamia. There are these two rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates, that create this fertile crescent And up at the top of that crescent, there's these people who are called the Assyrians. And for over 100 years, these people have been the superpower dominating the world. Brutally, viciously, violently. They have dominated all this area. Everyone has been under their control. And that is just the way of the world. That is the expected order 
for people living in this time. You just try to stay out of Assyria's way. But now something is changing. Because down at the southern end of this fertile crescent, there's this other people. And they're called the Chaldeans. And in the year 626, the Chaldeans set up their own kingdom with a capital in the city of Babylon. And the Neo-Babylonian Empire begins. And over the next few years, they expand. And by 612, they have overthrown Nineveh, the capital city of the Assyrians. And there's a new top dog. Seven years later, they face off against the Egyptians because the Egyptians think this is our chance. We can take back power. They come up and they fight up here at 605. The Egyptians are defeated, sent running back home. And that same year, down come the Babylonians and make their first invasion into this little kingdom, the kingdom of Judah. Their first invasion. Within 20 years, there isn't going to be a kingdom of Judah. There isn't going to be a city of Jerusalem. The temple of the Lord will be destroyed. That's what's about to happen for Habakkuk. Habakkuk says there's violence. Habakkuk says there's injustice, there's disorder, there's wickedness. And the Lord says, well, here's what I'm going to do. I am raising up the Chaldeans. It's a shocking turning point. We've had turning points in our history in the last 150 years. 150 years ago, most of the world was under the control of European nations, one way or another. A little over 100 years ago, there were still people who called themselves Caesar, ruling over Russia, Austria, Germany, Kaiser, Tsar, same word. The last of the Caesars fell. Rome didn't fall way back when. It fell then. And then, after a couple world wars, there were two superpowers on the world stage. And then we, most of us in this room can remember when suddenly there was just one. It was a shock. It was a surprise. And then after a decade or so, there was another shock because we thought we, were, we had won. We didn't have any enemies left. And then suddenly, September 11, 2001, no, we do. And if you live in Europe especially, you've experienced a big change in the last year. And the world is arming for war again. The times are changing. And we don't know what is coming. But we know that the ground is shifting. It always does one way or another. But Habakkuk is given this preview of the change that's coming. The Lord says, Habakkuk, you're in trouble. Don't worry, the cavalry is coming. But, but this isn't friendly cavalry. I'm raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle swift to devour. They all come for violence, all their faces forward. They gather captives like sand. At kings they scoff, and at rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress, for they pile up earth and take it. Then they sweep by like the wind and go on. Guilty men whose own might is their God. That's God's answer. And he knows his answer is shocking. Be amazed, be appalled at this, he says in verse 5. He knows that it's morally troubling. God does not say these are the good guys. These are not the good guys. They are violent. They are taking dwellings that don't belong to themselves. They are trusting in their own might and worshiping their own strength. 
how does this solve the problem of violence and wickedness? How does this help? And so Habakkuk objects. Lord, question? I I I have a question about this. Verses 12 to 17, Habakkuk again talks to the Lord. And again, Habakkuk sees a real problem. And Habakkuk has a posture of real faith. He comes to the Lord and he begins by holding on to who he knows God is. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One, who shall not die? O Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment, and you, O Rock, have established them for reproof. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong. I know that's who you are, Lord. I know that you are everlasting, and I know that you are good, all the way good, all the way down. You are perfectly good. You can't be on the side of evil. So why does it, why does it look like it? Why are you taking their side? Why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? Here again, the wicked has now shifted. He was looking at the wicked within God's people, within Judah, and saying the righteous are surrounded by the wicked here. But now this is someone even worse. And compared, I mean, at least here in Judah, some of us still trust you. At least here in Judah, there are people who are looking to the Lord. Habakkuk's words echo Abraham in Genesis chapter 18. Lord, you, how could you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Won't you do what's right, the judge of the earth? Won't you do justly? Habakkuk is troubled by this. He, he wants Israel to be renewed. He wants purification, not destruction. And so he lays out what he sees God doing in verse 14 to 17. You make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. And he, this is Babylon, Chaldea, pictured as a single person. He brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his dragnet. So he rejoices and is glad. Therefore he sacrifices to his net and makes offerings to his dragnet. For by them he lives in luxury and his food is rich. Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? This can't be the end of the story. This can't be the whole picture. In the movie The Princess Bride is a great movie. It's a story being told by a grandfather to his grandson. And it gets to the parts where it seems like the bad guys have won. And the boy interrupts and says, Grandpa, you're telling the story wrong. That's not how it goes. Grandpa, who gets the bad guy in the end? Who does it? Who kills him? No one does. He lives. What kind of story is this, Grandpa? We are right. Not to be satisfied with a story that ends like that. That can't be the whole story. Well, of course, we rarely get the whole story. We rarely get a final and complete answer. We want to know why is this happening in the world? Why is this happening to the people I love? Why is this happening to me? And it's not that God doesn't give us answers. But very often the answers he gives still leave gaps still leave us uncomfortable. 
sometimes raise new questions. So what do we do? We should do what Habakkuk does. We bring our questions to God. We bring them to him and we wait in our questions for answers. God does have answers for Habakkuk. He does lay out more of the picture for Habakkuk. And we'll look at that next week. Spoiler alert. God is not on the side of the wicked. The bad guys do not win in the end. God will bring all injustice and violence to account. He will wipe away every tear. He will make all things new. But Habakkuk doesn't rush us to that. In fact, he stops us. This book has been Habakkuk talking to the Lord. The Lord answers Habakkuk. Habakkuk talks to the Lord. And the Lord is going to talk to Habakkuk. But first, Habakkuk gives us 2 verse 1. Chapter 2, verse 1. And he pauses and says, I'm going to wait for an answer. He draws a line here and says, this answer doesn't come right away. I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. I am going to keep looking for God's response. I'm going to keep searching. I'm going to keep waiting and trusting, even though I don't get it. Even though my questions are not all answered, even though the answers are not comfortable. I am going to take my stand and watch. It's so important that we not rush to an easy answer. It's so important that we are willing to wait in that place, that uncomfortable place of questioning. We don't want to wait there. It's uncomfortable. We need to accept that discomfort as part of God's work in us. And while we wait, we hold on to what we know is true. And brothers and sisters, we know a lot more now than Habakkuk did because God has kept speaking and kept acting since Habakkuk's day. We know a lot more of the whole story. On this side of the coming of Jesus, we can see more clearly what God is doing in the world and why. And we need to hold on to that. Because God has not just stayed up in heaven listening to our prayers. In Jesus Christ, he has come down to be with us. To experience the struggle and the pain and the injustice and the violence of this world. And Jesus cried out, how Law, will I have to put up with this unbelieving world? He experienced that discomfort with us and for us. And at the end of the day, he was the only righteous person. And he was surrounded by the wicked. And took our place. We read earlier that God shows his love for us in this, that Christ died for the ungodly. That's me and you. And one day he will return and make all things new. That doesn't answer all our questions. But it helps us to trust him and to wait with the question to wait with our discomfort and look forward to the day when he will make it all clear. 
And it helps us to wait with others in their questions. And this is important. Very often when a Christian says, I'm, I'm having this struggle, I'm having this problem, we want to step in and say, here's the answer. Here's the solution. Let me give you this verse that answers that question, and so you'll be all better, and I won't have to be with you, the discomfort of you being in discomfort. God's word does have answers, and we should gladly share them, because we've got good news to share. But we shouldn't rush people. Often what people need at first is not an easy answer. They need their questions and their struggles taken seriously. God takes questions and struggles seriously. He has written them for us in his word. And so we should welcome people who struggle and question and say God cares about that. And we be patient with them the way God is patient with us. Because he is so patient and so good. Brothers and sisters, there is a lot wrong with the world. And we don't always get what God is doing. Keep on crying out to him. Keep on trusting him. Keep on waiting. Relying on his goodness, even when you don't see it. Even when you don't understand it. Because he is good all the time. Let's pray. Our great God, we thank you for the goodness that you have shown us in Jesus. We thank you that even when we don't know what's going on, we know that you are faithful and good. Help us, O oh Lord, to trust. Help us, O oh Lord, to wait. Help us, O oh Lord, to wait with those who are struggling and doubting and questioning. And Lord, do open our eyes. Enable us to see. Lead us out of darkness into light. And we pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen.